Hello, I'm Mark Sawicki. I'm a clay animator. In this program, I'm going to talk about how to do clay animation using a computer. To begin with, we'll have to build a clay animation puppet. And the first thing to do is to make a skeleton. These skeletons are called armatures. Let's take a look at one. An armature is an internal skeleton for the clay that helps support it. This is a sophisticated ball and socket armature that I used on a rock video. Now, what it does is illustrate a basic principle of armatures, and that is of the tie-down. You'll notice that this figure can stand on one foot, and the reason it can do so is because the other foot is bolted from underneath. This allows the puppet to defy gravity without the use of strings. The other great thing about the tie-down system is that some animators can pre-plot the move of where the figure is going to walk by pre-drilling holes in the stage. After the puppet has used the hole after bolting, we just take a similar colored clay and fill in the hole to make it disappear. Now an armature like this is very time consuming and expensive to make, but you can make one very simply out of wire, nuts, and epoxy. Let's go make one. We're going to need to sketch the figure out uh, to begin with. So um, what I do usually is start out with a ruler and I work to 1 12th scale, which means that that's about one inch to the foot. If my Gronk was a real Gronk, real life he'd be six feet tall, but here I'm making him six inches tall. Now if you draw realistic figures, Usually the uh, proportions are broken down by how many heads high they are. Now uh, a realistic figure might be six and a half heads high, but I'm not going to do that with the Gronk. I'm going to make him, uh, uh, goodness, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, a whole head up there. And then we're going to have his shoulders be about uh, the bottom of his neck. We'll put his waist about uh, two and a half inches, his hand will be about at three inches, and we'll put his knees about there. So you see by drawing a straight line you can sort of roughly break down the proportions of your figure. We're going to make his head here of course. His um, waist winds up down here. We're going to kind of give him a pot belly and a pear-shaped body. His knee will be here. We we'll have his feet come down like this. Shoulders will be a little bit below the head and I'm going to put his hand about here and our Gronk is going to be uh, carrying a big bone because that's what Gronks do and this kind of gives us the rough proportions of our figure. Now once we do this we can get a good idea of how our armature is going to have to be, where the pelvis is, where the head is, and then by using this rough sketch you can lay your armature wire on top of your sketch to get the proportions of your armature just right. Now the type of wire I use for armatures is the soft aluminum wire that has no spring to it whatsoever. So as you bend it, it stays where you bend it. And it makes it perfect for animation. Now what I do to give strength to the different limbs of the armature is take a length of this wire and I'll bend it in two. And then I will twist it together so that we have double the amount of wire. Put that into a vise here. Tighten that up. I take something like a chopstick and then I just start twisting the wire. It's a very simple operation. You'll lose about oh an eighth of the length of the wire, though that really doesn't matter because uh, the important thing is to get a bunch of nice finely twisted wire and then you can cut that to length when you need it. And this makes a wonderful strong arm or any type of a limb. So let's make a bunch of these and then we'll put them together using uh, epoxy. 
Okay, now we're back to our sketch so that we can plan out as we build our armature. We have a number of lengths of our twisted wire and I've used some pliers to uh, crunch out that uh, top part so we don't have a, a loop. Now the first thing I start out with is the tie downs. As I mentioned before, we like to uh, bolt the figure uh, to the base. So for that, I take a, uh, uh, a screw and a wing nut and I have this long nut connector. And what I'm going to do is space out how far the screw can go in. So by doing this, I can say, okay, if I screw this in now, that screw will only go this far into the threads. And when I do that, then I know that I can safely insert the wire and epoxy it in, and I'll have enough room for the screw to go in and enough body to hold the wire. Now, what I'm going to use to insert that is this epoxy, which is really great because this stuff is an epoxy resin and it has the hardener in the center. So all you do is knead it together to blend the two uh, uh, chemicals and then you can use it just like putty or clay and if you use it within 20 minutes uh, it'll be great. And this, th this stuff is hard as nails. So what I'm going to do to ensure that this epoxy only sticks to the metal and not to the to the screw I'm using a nylon screw here to be safe and I'm also just going to put the tiniest little bit of Vaseline on the end of it just to make sure that that epoxy doesn't lock the screw in there because that would be dreadful, wouldn't it? So we'll screw that in and to mix up the epoxy I make sure that I wear gloves whenever I'm dealing with a substance that I uh, don't know is uh, perfectly safe for you to use, it's always a good idea to protect yourself. Though I think they say that this stuff is uh, perfectly fine, but if you're unfamiliar with anything, always be safe. So we just take this and we knead it. So that's blended up good enough. Now I'm going to take a the length of it and I'm going to uh, make a little rod and stick that down the inside there. And then I'm going to take my wire and I'm going to stick it inside there. And to be on the safe side, I'm going to uh, add a little bit of epoxy on the outside to help ensure that that is locked in. So once that hardens there will be no way of pulling that wire out of this nut. We'll do the same thing for his head. We'll just put a ball of the epoxy up here. We have a head. We'll cut this length off in a bit. And then we'll have other lengths for the arm. So you can see we're measuring this out to get the proportions just right. Good. We can take this and we can loop it around. Like that. Then we can take more of the epoxy and 
use that as a uh, binder and also the the base for the upper body here. And now these are the two leg tie downs. I'm going to bend those over. They'll be nicely situated there. Loop this around. Cut this. And we will crunch this in place and we'll seal this part of the torso. And the other thing I'm going to do is take a remaining um, nut and I'm going to insert that into the base of the pelvis so that I'll have the option of also bolting his body to the stage if necessary. And in just a few minutes we'll have a rock hard assembly. While our armature is hardening, I wanted to talk a little bit about the clay I use to animate with. The clay we'll be using today is Sculpey. Sculpey is a wonderful polymer clay that has different formulas that allow the clay to be baked in your home oven to different consistencies. For the animation today, we'll be using three of their clays. One will be Sculpey Flex. Now Sculpey Flex, once you mold it and bake it in your oven, will come out the consistency of rubber. Needless to say, this is great for animation. The second clay is Sculpey 3. Now even though you can bake this clay so it becomes hard, I like to use it in animation and not bake it so it's always soft and pliant so that I can create metamorphic effects with my animation. The third clay is the Sculpey Primo. This is a very high quality polymer clay that will bake to a very hard consistency. I use this for props or things that I don't want to distort, like eyeballs and teeth. So let's see how we use all three of these clays in the animation character that we're about to create. Okay, and here's our completed armature. You see that epoxy is hard as a rock now, and it fits over our drawing. Now we're going to add one more piece for the bone here. We just stick a wire up through there that's about the length of the bone and we'll crunch it down. And now we're ready to start sculpting. Now there are several varieties of clay that we're going to use, but I'm going to start out with the, uh, the hard version of Sculpey, which is the Primo. This gives a very hard uh, quality clay once it's baked. And we're going to use that for a couple of the things. First thing will be the bone. We'll sculpt that up and then we'll do the eyeballs. So I'll just knead this. Sometimes a good way to knead the clay is to warm it up by doing this in your hands. You have to make sure that your hands are fairly clean because when you're working with white clay it picks up everything. And then we will just put push the clay around the bone here. And it can be just kind of loosey-goosey. Once we get the general idea that it's a, a bone, we'll put a little indentation up here. And we'll do the same here. And we'll want to try to profile it, you see, so since animation works as a moving art, the more pronounced you can make the general profile, the better. And that's why I'm kind of making this more of a heart shape. Now for the eyeballs, I like to lay down a sheet of glass here and take my Primo Sculpey and measure out a couple of couple of eyes. He's kind of a smallish character, so I'm going to make a couple of really tiny eyeballs. And to make them smooth and glassy, I rub them up against the glass, like so. And that gives a nice smooth surface. 
Now to make the uh, iris, I take a little bit of colored clay. In this case, I, I think he should have brown eyes. And I make much smaller balls and I put them onto the white like this. roll it a little bit more. You might have to do several of these in order to, you know, look out and get the perfect eyeballs. But this is how I go about making my iris. And once those are out there, you're going to need a pupil. For the pupil, I just put the tiniest little hole in the center. Now this is very useful. Not only does it look like a, a pupil, which it is, but when you animate, you can insert your needle tool into the socket of the eye and animate the eye. And here we have two eyeballs that we can set aside and bake hard. Now, the other thing that we'll want to do with our white clay is make a tooth. Because he's got that one pronounced tooth that juts out out of his lower jaw. So we just put a little blob of clay there and that'll be his tooth. Now in order to make the flexible skin of our Gronk character, I like to use the flexible brand of Sculpey. Now the flexible brand that I bought today uh, pretty much has the primary colors but doesn't have a, a flesh tone of one of my ancestors called Gronk. So I need to blend this clay in order to come up with a skin tone. So uh, as a point of comparison, I have two other brands of Sculpey here. This is Sculpey 3. It has the lighter beige and then there's the darker Super Sculpey. And uh, what we're going to do is use these colors and blend them together to come up with these two tones. Because when we animate, we are going to do a blending or a combination of the flexible Sculpey along with um, uh, the Sculpey that's not baked. So this can be a very malleable and uh, uh, metamorphic type of uh, substance to animate with, while this will hold its shape. So when we look at this, we can sort of see that they're essentially the same color, except this has much more white in it. And this is a more saturated color. There's less white in it. But essentially, if you went all the way down the line, you would start out with essentially a brown. And uh, what we'll do is use the yellow, green, and red to combine together to make a reddish brown uh, mother color. And we just need little bits of it. So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of red here. Be very tiny. I'm looking at it all in proportion to the white because we're going to be adding it to the white. So we have about this much red and then half that amount of green and the same amount of yellow. So the green and yellow are pretty much even and we just add a little bit more red to give it a, a reddish tint. So now we will blend all of these three together. There we are. So by a great stretch of the imagination you could see that if we followed this scale down we might wind up with a color like that. So what I'm going to do is, seeing that this is kind of a reddish brown, I'm just going to take the tiniest bit of it, just the tiniest bit, and blend it in with the white to sneak up on either one of these two colors. So this color, as you can see, is sort of getting there. You can almost see that we're following the steps, aren't we? But what I'm going to do is add a little bit more brown to this to darken it even a little bit more. 
it's better to sneak up on it because it's really hard to add the white clay so you might run out of it. It's a little darker but I've decided to add a little bit more, a little bit of the rest of it. There you go. So we snuck up on it and as you can see we're pretty darn close in, uh, in the same tone as our uh, Sculpey 3. So what I'm going to do is use the Flex Sculpey for the arms and legs and use the Sculpey 3 for his face. And I think it's time to um, make a hand that will grasp the bone. I won't go into the particulars about how I'm doing this because the how to sculpt tape is also out because we want to hurry up and sculpt this guy together so that we can get on to the important business of animation. So here we have his basic hand. And we will have him grasp the bone like this. And if we want, we can use a little chopstick to make little indentations to represent his fingernails. Now what we'll do for the other arm is I am just going to put the flexi clay on and not make a hand. Because sometimes I find that it's easier to animate a hand with soft clay than it would be to put armatured fingers in and the like. Though some people uh, certainly like to do that. But I'm just going to end this just like that. And then what I'll do is reserve a little bit of this clay and not bake it. And once this is baked, I will attach the unbaked clay hand to it. And because they're exactly the same color, uh, it'll blend in perfectly. And if they don't, you can always do little tricks like give him a bracelet. <laughs> and that will, that will cover up any, any imperfections. I'm going to give him a rather big foot. Because that might be also part of his relative family <laughs> is the Bigfoot class. And the design is also kind of predicated on the uh, design of the armature. Because in this case, we made this uh, nut so large, I'm going to uh, give him sort of like a Popeye appendage where the bottom of his foot is quite, quite thick and heavy. And of course, I leave room so that we can screw in that bottom screw. And if we should happen to see the bottom of his foot, we'll just plug that hole up with clay and you'll never know the difference. There we are. So we've added a little cartoon distortion to the feet. because He's a big plodding character. So boom, 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 feet like this. And we have a combination of hard Primo Sculpey and the Sculpey Flex for the hand. And then we let this taper out to uh, just a rounded end and then we'll put just a soft clay hand on there afterward and the rest of his body will be soft clay. We'll add those eyeballs in the tooth and this fellow's ready to bake. Fresh out of the oven, the uh, bone is hard and uh, the Sculpey Flex allows us to move his arm. So he's all ready for animation. Now the other thing I've noticed that when we baked the uh, Sculpey Flex, it darkened a little bit. But this is a good thing because I can take the Sculpey 3 flesh tone and what has happened is that it has darkened to just about the same consistency there. So I can blend the Sculpey Flex with 
the Sculpey 3 and then I can have an animation clay puppet that's the best of both worlds. So I'll blend in his hand here and then I'll have the ability to bend the arm without distorting the clay. I can freely do these gross movements and yet I'll have the uh, very soft Sculpey clay to do a lot more subtle animation work because this is the raw clay. Now it's time to work on the face. First thing I do, I'm going to make give him a little bit of a pointed head because grogs don't have uh, much of a brain pan, you see. And then I'm going to take those two eyeballs that we baked along with our grog. We're going to set them down inside the clay. Now the thing about cavemen is they have very pronounced brows. So we're going to get a very big brow for our caveman. Matter of fact, it's so big that you can barely see his eyes under it. We're going to smooth that into his, his top of his head there. This is Gronk. Put that here. The thing about Gronk's upper lip, he might have that little indentation there. And we'll smooth this part out. And remember that tooth we made. I'll put that little tooth there. And then we're going to take some more clay and make a very big jaw. Like this. And this is a... Now it's looking very much like a gronk. Lower lip. Because he is a gronk. All gronks have big lower lips little tiny noses, tiny little ears as well. I'll put those over here. Make a little indentation. So some dark brown clay for the upper eyebrow. And there we have a gronk. Now to save on clay, I'm going to bulk up the middle of the figure with aluminum foil. And then I'm going to give gronk his outfit. Drape this around here. Make sure he's got a raggedy, daggedy edge. And then I'll just keep smoothing that out. Make sure he has an appropriate pot belly. Make, make the edges here a little torn up. So it's a whole of blending. Hard Sculpey for the eyes and the tooth. Uh, soft Sculpey 3 for the uh, parts that might need to metamorphosize. And of course the Sculpey Flex for the parts that I'm going to be moving quite a lot and don't want to take the time to re-sculpt. So now once we've uh, pretty much finished this guy, let's mount him and start to animate. Well how do you get your stop motion animation into the computer? Well you can use a digital camera. Now there are many cameras on the market, but the one that I find is ideal for doing stop motion animation is this one, a Sony TRV27 digital video camera. Now this is an older camera, but it's terrific because it gives you manual control over the focus and the exposure, very important for animation. This camera is also great because it has all these outputs. 
a USB port, Firewire port, S-Video, regular video, that allows you to take the signal from the camera and feed it directly into the computer where you can do animation with Stop Motion Pro software. This is terrific software for animation and it can be used with all kinds of different cameras. Web cameras, video cameras, high def cameras, even high quality digital still cameras for professional use. So let's set up that TRV-27 and give Stop Motion Pro a whirl. Now here we've set up our camera on a tripod so it doesn't move. We take the tape out of the camera so that the camera doesn't automatically shut itself off. What we want to do is just send the signal from the camera directly to the computer. Now I want you to notice that when I put my hand in front of the lens, the camera automatically brightens up and focuses on my hand. We don't want it to do this because it creates all sorts of image fluctuations when you do animation. What we want to do is set the lens to manual and the exposure to manual. Now you'll see that when I put my hand in front, nothing changes. Nothing changes except the changes I make in the animation. Now let's take a look at that software. Okay, well now we're ready to set up Stop Motion Pro, so we just double click on the icon there. And Stop Motion Pro pops up and it asks us if we want to create a new project. We say yes, and then our new project name will be M-A-R-K-1. And we say okie dokie. It recognizes what camera I have hooked up to it, a DV camera. I just say OK, and there it is. You can see it's a live view, so you always know how to position your figure. And the beauty of this software is that you can animate at all these different frame rates, from 5 frames a second, 6 frames a second, all the way on up to 29.97 frames per second, or 30 frames a second. And that's the one we're going to choose. So in order to start doing animation, all you do is click on the camera button. Click on that, red line appears, you've taken a picture. Now we can just move our little kiwi, take another picture, move it some more, take another picture, another picture, another, and before you know it, you click on the play button, and you've got animation. It's as simple as that. Now as an animator, I need to figure out the motion and timing of my character and how many frames it's going to take for that character to do certain actions. In this case, we want Gronk to beat on a drum. So I want him to beat on that drum at a certain rhythm. So to break that down by the frame, what I'll do is take a stopwatch and time out a certain movement that I beat out with my finger. So let's give this a try. Let's say we want him to hit the drum uh, at about this tempo. So we'll time it and count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that was about five seconds, about ten beats in five seconds. So let's work out a little bit of mathematics here and figure out how many frames that's going to be. So if he has 10 hits in 5 seconds, that's 2 hits in 1 second. And since we're at the video frame rate of 30 frames per second, that'll be 1 hit will take 15 frames. So now we can go over to Gronk and break down his motion of 1 hit into 15 different increments. Okay, well we have our Gronk here and he's all set up on our animation table. I've bolted him from underneath so he doesn't move around. And I've done the same thing with our little drum. A lot of the classic animators would use a uh, surface gauge like this one to kind of gauge and remember uh, the positions of their animation puppets as they went through their movement. But you can build something very similar to that by just uh, taking a block of wood and screwing a wire to it. And what we're using our handy dandy homemade surface gauge for is to kind of gauge where the middle of his stroke will be when he hits that drum. So if you trace the end of his club all the way down to the drum, that surface gauge is pointed to about the halfway mark. Now since we know that his cadence is to beat the drum once every 15 frames, and I want to make the downstroke of his 
club action uh, quite violent, I'm going to break it down to make this 5 frames for the hit and then 10 frames back up. And then if you cycle that, of course, it's 10 and 5, which would make 15, and 15, and 15, and so on. And uh, this animation should be able to uh, cycle freely because I'm going to make a visual reference that the top of his club is right at the top of his head. Okay, so since I'm going to make this move in five frames, and that's the middle point, and I want to have an ease in, then from this point to here, I figure I'll break this down into two movements, and then from here to there, we'll break that up into three. Now halfway between here and there would be uh, like frame two, and then halfway between here and the starting point would be a pretty good position for our very first frame. So I'm going to move it to about that position, and then always remember to remove your surface gauge, and then take a picture. Now we'll put the surface gauge back, and see we, I'm registering it on the corner here, so I always know I'm placing this in the same place. Now we want to go, this is our mid-frame, but now I want to go halfway between here, and that will accelerate the club movement a little bit more. Take that away, and we'll take our picture. Put the surface gauge back. Now we can use the surface gauge as a goal, because now I know that I want to bring this up to halfway. So now I'm halfway through the move. Now that we're aligned, I'll take a picture. Now I can use the surface gauge to tell me where we've just been. I can move it now if I want. And now I want to move the club from here to the halfway point, which would be about there. Straighten his arm a little bit. Maybe tilt the club a little bit. Now at this point, this is the frame just before he hits that drum. And most people, when they're about to do something that's unpleasant, they have a little bit of anticipation. So now what we're going to do is have a little bit of replacement animation. I'm going to make him blink a little bit by putting very similar colored clay on his eyes. We'll just close the eyelids by half because he's about to expect that he's going to hit that drum very, very violently. All right, now we take a picture. And now we won't need the surface gauge anymore because we'll use the surface of our drum as a gauge. And I'm going to move it a little bit past the drum and then have it rest upon the drum like this. But now I'm going to do some more replacement animation by removing this drum and I'm going to replace it with a thicker drum. You see, it's, a, it's identical, but it's distorted. And this will be a little bit of replacement animation. And I've made some guide marks on the table, so I can pretty much place it where the other drum was. And it'll look like when he hits this drum that he's actually distorted the drum itself and bowed it out. Now, along with that, we'll work in a clockwise direction, and we'll close his, uh, we'll do more replacement animation of his eyes. We'll take off this clay, and now we'll put his eyes closed all the way. And it just has to be a suggestion, you know, you don't have to be that perfect about it. Because this is all going past very, very quickly. And we might raise his eyebrows a little bit to get some of that distorted animation. And we will raise his feet a little bit and raise his other arm and spread his fingers a little bit, because when he hits that drum, bang, everything happens. So now we'll take a picture, and now we will lift 
his hand off the drum a little bit, remove the distorted drum, and go immediately back to our other drum here. And bolt that to the table so it doesn't move. We have reference marks of where that was. And we can use that as a gauge of how far up we're going. Now we're on frame six and also working in this direction so you don't forget what's going on. I lift his feet up a little bit more and his hand a little bit more. Maybe spread those fingers a bit. Get a lot of subtle changes in the clay. And for his eyelids, we will remove this. And we will again put the half lids on there. Now we'll take a picture. Again, starting with a club, take that up just a little bit. And we're remembering that from here to the midpoint of our swing, we want it to be there in about five frames starting from here. Okay. So we lifted that up a little bit. Lift his feet up just the tiniest bit because now that's at the top of the ease in. Starting to ease it out now. Now we'll remove these eyelids. So he has his original adorable expression. Always be very conscious of keeping things fairly clean throughout the process. Take a picture. Put this up again. Now we'll start a little descent with the feet. A descent with his other arm here, and we may lower the eyebrows a little bit. Take a picture, a little bit more. This gets a little lower, that closes in, lowers down. Another picture. Should be pretty much toward the, yeah, a little bit past the uh, halfway mark there, but we're doing quite well. Lower these a little bit. And this comes in because we want to get back to the starting position for this guy. Okay, take a picture. Move his club a little bit further. Just a touch down on the feet and a touch for his hand. Curl the fingers slightly and get those eyebrows back. Take a picture. At this point, it's pretty much just the arm movement now. Maybe just touch this slightly. Now we're almost done. Picture. Tilt the bone, raise the arm, and take a picture. And now we are at the start. So he's pretty much in the same position that he was when he started. And now when we play back this animation and cycle it, you'll be able to see that he'll beat the drum. Boink! <laughs> there he is. The nice thing about this viewer is it has a slider. So you can move to certain frames of your animation and actually work out what you did when you animated. See, here's our ease in. We're getting progressively bigger. There's the switch of our replacement animation for the drum. The feet are going up. He's out of his blink. So this is a wonderful tool for practicing and studying your work. Let's take a closer look at this and cycle it for some fun. <laughs> well, there you have it. Stop motion with clay. So have fun and keep on animating. Now the only thing is, what to animate him doing next? Of course. Bye-bye.